it's Jemima here from Soundsphere. Today we'll be interviewing Kofi Smiles about his activism work for BLM. So thank you for spending time with me today, Kofi. It's all right, man. It's good. It's good. How are you doing? You all right? I'm good. I'm good. Yes. So shall we kick off? Start with yeah, the it's questions. Been, it's been interesting, isn't it? It's been a busy few weeks. Yeah, definitely. So. How are you feeling about everything? A bit more uh, relaxed? Chill. Yeah, a lot better. Definitely. I'm a lot mm. more relaxed. Before I was a bit unhinged. I think that's the right word. But mm. I think I've leveled out now. So. Uh, first of all, how are you coping with it all? Um, I think it got to a point, I think last week I was talking to my sister and I was like, man, I'm fucking knackered. You know what I mean? I'm so tired. And I was like, you tired? And she was like, yeah, she was tired because her and my other sister have been doing quite a bit of campaigning because they live in Leeds. And, and they run this page called Afro Leeds um, on Instagram and they were asked to go and speak at the event and I went to watch them and keeping up with all the... Uh, newspaper articles and posting information and bits yourself and making sure you've always got something not to say but to sort of keep in the stream on social media it is quite exhausting because you know it's finding the stuff it's reading this it's reading the information but each time you do outsource any bit of information it can trigger something similar to a personal experience that you might have had and you i find that we're sort of in large and small ways we're reliving this trauma of yeah. racism um there's being no black break for us is there there's no break yeah. for no. we can't switch it off do you know what i mean we can't not fight for the um social justice can we the racial injustice that the, the sort of the racial injustice that uh, you know permeates all institutions in this country once you start becoming aware to it and once you realize that you can do something about it which i think i'd like to stress people can do something about it we're not powerless to it. i used to feel like we're quite powerless to it to sort of go along with it or say, you know you change things with the art you make but from what i've seen and from what i know is happening here in hope from what's come out of the various black lives matter protests that we had in the city which were extremely pay, um uh peaceful and um attended as well to a lot of people's surprise <laughs> A lot of stuff is happening in the background that a lot of people don't realise. A lot of people I won't, see, I won't see until probably a week or so. But there's been big change. I think there's big change coming to the city of Hull, which is going to be good. Yeah, definitely. There's another BLM protest on the 11th of July, I believe, at Queen's Gardens. Where, were you aware? Is it 15th? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next week. Next week, Wednesday. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. So, yeah. Are you going to be speaking then? I don't think I'll be speaking, but I'll be att- I'll definitely be attending, and I'm going to be helping organise. If anything, if anyone needs any help or any assistance, I'll be able to give them a hand as well. So, okay. but hopefully, I'll, um, I'm going to see, um, hopefully I'll be there to report as well. So, okay. Uh, yeah. What are your hopes for the movement, and what do you want to happen as a result of all of this fighting that we're doing at the moment? I think. In a perfect world, Black Lives Matter shouldn't be a thing. Mm-hmm. People sh- we shouldn't be out there campaigning, fighting and protesting for basic human rights just to be treated fairly. Again, you know, we have to say we're not looking for revenge as what a lot of people seem to think. You know, there's that whole fear of a black planet sort of rhetoric that clouds a lot of people's minds about this. Like, so, you know, if they get too much power, they're going to do to us what we did to them. And it's like, nah. Nah, bro, that's, that's not what no, we want. That's we don't not, want revenge, it's just yeah. equality. Yeah, well, that's not, yeah, but, it's, it's, but to some people, revenge is equality. Do you know what I mean? Um, I guess I just want to be able to see, um, I want the, the haters and the naysayers to be like, the ones that are like, oh, this moment will pass. I want them to realise it's not a moment, it's a movement. Mm-hmm. Nah, each step, each action, each day, minds have been changed people have been won over to the side of, you know, it's everybody against the racist. Yeah. And I just hope that people are listening to what people are compa- campaigning for. I know that each sort of faction around the country seems to be, have a main focus that's different to each other, but then the, all these sort of issues and focuses overlap. And I guess I'm just looking for the time where they can be like, look, oh, you know, we've done what we achieved. We've got people to be aware of the institutional, institutional biases that exist. We've got these actual people in these places that are um, acknowledging and being accountable for racism and actually doing something to change it and to make it part and parcel that yeah. these sort of attitudes and behaviours that don't permeate into more and more generations and stuff. And 
I hope it feeds into other aspects of society as well. So obviously with Black Lives Matter, predominantly looking at, you know, the lives and conditions of uh, black people, black and brown people here in the UK and the States and the world, pretty much the world over. I hope people start to sort of think, well, if this is how black people feel, how do what we actually do with the women, you know what I mean? How we're tackling um, sexism and misogyny, um, how we're looking at how we're making people with various disabilities feel included. Is there enough access for them in our workspaces, in our public spaces like museums and, you know, art galleries, uh, concert halls, all this sort of stuff. I just hope it just, this, I just hope this sort of, um, I hope this way of conscious, of, uh, of this conscious compassion yeah. and, you know, thinking about other people, I hope it just trickles out into everything and we start looking at compassion, even like making sure it's something nurseries and junior schools are looking at focusing on a bit more with things like mindfulness, you know what I mean? How do we understand ourselves? We understand and respect ourselves a lot more. I think that carries on to your fellow neighbours as well. And, you know, I just, I just hope that this is that, you know, catalyst moment. I think moment. that phrase, yeah. conscious compassion, is so powerful. I feel that perfectly just sums up BLM. Just mm. being aware of that we should be compassionate as opposed to... Because mm. for a lot of us, we weren't taught to be compassionate to others. It's mm. not inherent for us. Whereas conscious compassion, it's an active sort of anti-racist motive. Mm. And yeah, I think that's a perfect way to describe it. And I think with it as well, it's like, you know, you don't have to feel compassionate just because you see someone sad. You know, and if you see someone who's like homeless living on the streets, you shouldn't be there, you know, pitying someone. I feel like I need to help them because of his situation. You know, it can take a bit of forefront. You don't have to see people or understand that racism is happening. You don't have to hear racism or have it blatantly um, appear in front of your face to understand that there is, a, is an issue or understand things about sexism or understand things about um, disabilities. Or you, so you have to see all these stuff firsthand. You just have to know that I, as an individual, know that there are things happening in this world that I, as an individ- individual, could lend my hand to to make better. Because I don't know, you know, I've had this philosophy that I've, I, I guess it's been instilled into me from my, from my mum. But it's like, you know, we leave the world a better place than we found it. Yeah. And if we found it writhing and filled with inequalities all over the place, then what can we do to sort of level the, the, the playing field? What can I do as an individual to level the playing field? And, you know, you might get involved in one thing. Um, and I've talked about this with my friends who are vegan. And it's like, I know a lot of people who go vegan who feel like, oh, well, that's it. I'm doing my bit. I'm friend- I dirty animal products, you know. I mean, I save so many lives a year and I'm not in getting in- got involved or um, dancing with um, unnecessary death for personal gain and profit. Mm-hmm. And the thing, that's it. And it's like, well, you know, I think, you know, once veganism, be- veganism becomes your norm, what's the next thing? What's the next yeah. thing you could look at? Is it using less water? Is it um, yeah, less carbon emissions? Is it um, looking at into more about uh, feminism or intersectionality in terms of like social justice causes um and it's just the way but then again that comes down to i think the individual in terms of what where they see them where, where they feel like entitled not necessarily entitled but where they want to and what they think they need to do or they're calling as an individual on this planet as i don't know what that is is it to help people or is it just to sort of get by have a it? calling on kind of innate responsibility to help people mm. like, i think we all have that innate responsibility we should be helping others not just because it benefits them but because it benefits us as well mm. like it makes you feel good to help someone else so it's kind of a win-win situation in the end yeah and we're social creatures as well do you know what i mean i'm like oh our i guess our ancestors and you know us ourselves you know we're all drawn to tribes aren't we we're drawn to hanging out and spending time with people who are like-minded or have the same sort of interest and you know you want to because you feel like there's a connection there there's a sense of security there um there's a there's an understanding there and you can't really put a price on that yet why would you want to be able to do that with as many people as possible why would you want to think well i'm only i'm happy with this lot you sort of look a little bit like me, you sound a little bit like me, you think very like me. You're missing so. out so much though, if you just stick to like your own small exactly. group. Exactly. Shooting yourself in the foot. 
So but that's all sort of, edu- it's all inherent, isn't it? You learn this sort of stuff. Yes. And so I guess it depends on what situation you've been in in your youth about expanding your outlook and expanding mm-hmm. sort of your, I get, and I get, I will use this like as um, your entitlement to understand and see the world as a bigger, as a, as a, as a, as a bigger space other than the postcode, then obviously you're going to want to wonder and like see and venture and know um, more about other people. And a lot of people don't feel like it's for them. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't feel like they should. A lot, feel, a lot of people don't feel like they can. So it's like, if you're, if you're being brought up, like being told that that space isn't for you or, you know, brought up with sort of blinkers on and limited vision, then, you know, if that's all you know, then that's all you know. Yeah. Which is so we are still in a pandemic at the moment, though. So uh, for you, what's been mm. one of the hardest things about this pandemic and what are you most looking forward to when a vaccine is released? I think the hardest thing is for me because my life hasn't, and I'm so grateful for this. And this is, and, you know, I, every day when I go to work and I can still exercise and, and, and even though I'm exercising differently, I still get to exercise. Is hearing the stories of people whose lives have been turned upside down and the people that have lost loved ones, you know what I mean? It's like, it's just like, not only are people having to adjust to this really, really strange way of living, they can't spend last moments with family, they can't have funerals that certain family members is there people have lost jobs livelihoods and um, existence you know what I mean there everything has changed for a lot of people and I just feel like when I hear stories like this you, I've said to some people without being dramatic or you know hyperbolic it's like it's a bit like survivor's guilt for some people that are working every day getting the paycheck not having to really worry about job security and just cracking on and you know touch wood none of my you know loved ones have you know like, caught coronavirus and stuff and it's just, it's just sad hearing these stories that so, so many people have been affected and the, the future for them is very, very uncertain. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's just like, and it, you know, and it's just hearing all these like stats and figures about people from um, black communities, uh, black and brown communities, uh, is it four times more likely to die from coronavirus, to catch coronavirus? And Something like that, yeah, the pain all, reports, terrifying, isn't it? Yeah, and, and looking at all this the um the social constructs around that you know what I mean usually black and brown people are in more front facing jobs where the the risk of contacting the coronavirus from someone else is a lot higher and usually people from these backgrounds don't have that much money or don't work in jobs where they can get furloughed or they can work from home they actually have to go out and do it which again increases the risk and then you know you look at how black people are treated in the healthcare system and you know, yeah, you women are four times be, more likely to die in childbirth. Yeah. Pardon? Do you think that's going to be a major obstacle in kind of achieving what BLM wants? The fact that so many black and brown people are on the front lines and are occupied at the moment, do you think that's holding us back? Um, I don't think, I don't think so because again, with the one thing with the black eye, um, black lives, black eyes, black, black lives matter movement at the moment um, is that, you look at Hull, you know, you look at places like Leeds where predominantly white people are showing up and helping the numbers and wanting to turn up and listen and spread the word and take what they've heard and what they learnt into the spaces to the ears where black ears wouldn't go. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, we had one, we had Marvino at the Leeds one who was saying, look, you guys go to your parents or your uncle who is a lawyer or a judge or a doctor, or, you know, he's running his own, he's got his own firm and you say, dad, did you know about this? And make sure they know about the stats. And, that's huge. That's massively powerful. Mm-hmm. Like I think because quite a lot of the black people that aren't on the front lines, quite a lot of them uh, sort of a bit older. They're the ones that may not have come out to protest. Maybe, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But um, um, I don't know. I don't think it's going to harm the movement because I think the people that have wanted to come or, or that the people that are out and wanted to come did come. Mm-hmm. and we'll come to further ones and you know we'll come to the next ones and then try and encourage more people to come to the next ones but I think it looks I think we're fighting a war on I know we're fighting a war on a battle on many fronts yeah. but having black and brown people on the front lines fighting the coronavirus in our wonderful NHS and have seen like you know they're I guess they're kids or nieces nephews you know friends fighting another battle on the front lines of social injustice it's just it just shows the resilience of us as as peoples, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? And it's like, it's, we just don't stop. We don't stop because we can't stop. 
Exactly. And speaking of that, like, what is what has given you the most hope recently? What has kept you going recently? I guess it's the support and the love that I'm getting from like my my friends and and I'm talking like predominantly like from my my black friends and how we just all seem to be in this and understand each other and I think uh, for a lot of us it's brought us a lot closer because it's like wow we were learning about this stuff 10-15 years ago in school watching videos of the civil rights movement in the states not not in the UK not like the um, the Bristol bus boycott or anything like that um, but we were watching these moments happen and we were like wow this was like in the 60s and people were fighting this and you know thank god so much for better now in the mid 2000s but then yeah definitely we're, we're getting up on onto walls onto podiums and we're speaking through megaphones about our experiences as growing up as the only black kids in our respective schools and sharing stories of racism and it's like the, and then you you can't sort of come home you look at the pictures and you think wow it didn't mean we're well, part of the civil, i'm speaking at i'm speaking at civil rights movement 2020 i was looking at pictures about this sort of stuff years ago and i, I know i'm i'm a part of history yeah or we're part of history now did it mean everyone who's turned up has now become a part of history and i'm just like what is going on but i'm i'm kind of i sort of feel some sort of solace by like white people listening finally listening but then it, i get a little bit frustrated like what I'm explaining to people is that white people don't listen to black people about racism. Mm -hmm. White people listen to white people about racism. Yes, now, it's a, it's, a, I don't know, it's a bit of truth, that, but it's something we've got to sort of like learn how to sort of get used to the flavour, get used to the taste of it, because that's the only way things are going to change. And because there seems to be so many more white people wanting to sort of spread the gospel, then I can't complain about that. I'm still sort of finding it a little bit weird that if I get into like a... Uh, you know, you see someone comment something on a page and you're on a, on a comment that's, you know, rude and insensitive and racist, ignorant, and I might write something or, or someone might write on a post of mine or all those matter or some bullshit. And then, like, I might have a bit of a back and forth. Then all of a sudden there's, like, 20 people joining in the conversation battering this one person with words. And it's just like, I've never really felt that before. I've usually only had, like, two or three maybe four people who have actually caught that thread on facebook and joined in and then it's felt like the whole new wow level, people a whole new level of solidarity yeah and it's like i'm trying i'm thinking like how long does this last do i want to get used to this can i get <laughs> used to this um should i get used to this but i think the thing that gives me hope is the fact that so much of this knowledge is seem to be retained and people are putting it into practice mm -hmm. And the fact that people have actually been able to mobilise and capitalise on what is actually happening with the movement now and making it work. Mm -hmm. People are realising that these things take time. People are realising there are no quick fixes and that everything is a process. That gives me hope. People are understanding what this is and what we're in and what they're getting in for. That really gets me hope. That's because that's like, once you get into understanding what happens with civil, liberty, civil, civil liber liberties and how long it can actually take to lock down, to nail down and change things and the processes. If people, are, people seem to be understanding that. Yeah. People seem to want to help. So many people, people are researching into civil liberties as well. And the yeah. books that people are buying and reading and like the, the amount of times people are now, I've seen a, so, a, a huge drop, a significant drop in people that are emailing me or messaging me on social media and asking me questions and what about this, what about that? And the same people. And some of them say friends. Most of them say they were just having on some so social media pa uh, platform. We were wanting to talk about this stuff at first, but now there's a thought sort of backing off because people really, really throw themselves into their own research. It's, it gives me hope because now a lot of people who, before I would have thought they would never have considered, wouldn't even loved, um, looked at watching, I don't know, Ava, Ava DuVernay's 13th or when they see us all picking up, you know, natives by Carla or Arthur Hurt, she's British. They're, they're, they're doing it. Do you know what I mean? They're doing it on their own time. And, you know, it's changing them. I feel like it's really, really changing people. But I'm, I don't want to say it's like, you know, it's, it's hope without thinking logically about this sort of stuff. It's hope thinking that, okay, this is what's happening now and how do we keep these people entertained? It's hope knowing that we have to sort of do something in order to, 
keep this conversation going slightly yeah. whether it's using the platform i have with work or sort of by just putting stuff on facebook twitter and seeing putting stuff out there and seeing what bites and seeing if people still want to talk about it still you see if people still want to do something about it and it seems like that's the case it might not be as loud and the hashtag might not be sort of like blinking on social media but this chat is still there people are still posting stuff and yeah, it's so imperative it's a that hell of a lot more keep going isn't it mm. so imperative yeah. Um, so, are you uh, hopeful? Sorry? Are you hopeful? I'm very hopeful. I think optimism, well, I don't, well, I'm kind of copying Audrey a lot here, but she said optimism is a political act. Mm. And someone else I read said uh, cynicism is a sign of obedience. And wow. if we don't stay positive, if we don't keep fighting for a better world, then there never will be one. Mm. Um, oh, you're right. I think, yeah, recently I've been listening to a lot about Bob Marley because his music was played a lot in the uh, kind of riots and the movements in like the 70s and stuff. Mm. And uh, going off that, what is the sound of the revolution for you? What The sound of the revolution? Yeah. Oh, at the moment, what have I been listening to? Do you know what? I think on my, I have actually been listening to I said, what was it? Anita Baker's Sweet Love. I had that on a lot um, just because it would chill me out and I just love it. There's a bass line in there which MF Doom uses in um, on a um, mm, food, the yeah, oh, I can't remember what Hoe Cakes. Um, and I was just like, I don't know, it just linked me. I'm just thinking, at the moment, how would I sum up right now in a song? I think Sampa the Great, Final Form, would be pretty good. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. It has to be a black woman artist because I think black women are leading this movement and they've always held down black men as well. You know, black women are the biggest supporters of black men and we can't even, we can barely give them a whoop whoop. I'm just looking on my iTunes at what I've been listening to quite a lot recently. And because I consume so much music, it's like some stuff doesn't stick. The only thing I could, yeah, I think the Joey Badass as well. There's a song called For My People from his 2017 album, All American Badass. Um, oh, I don't know. This is tough. That's a really, really good question. I could do you a playlist easy. <laughs> like that. You should make easy. a playlist. Make a playlist. The sound of the revolution. That would be I amazing. could easy do you a playlist, but I couldn't. I don't think I could sum it up in one shit song. I have been listening to a lot of Megan Thee Stallion recently. She's got this song called Girls in the Hood, which samples Boys in the Hood for Men, um, end of your way. But let me do your let me do your playlist okay, I'm, I'm excited <laughs> i've got loads okay. of these let me do your playlist yeah i'll do your playlist and then i'll definitely like sing it over i think because i've been listening to music for different times because when it comes down to um what's been happening with black lives matter i haven't really been listening to music during the day it's just been podcasts because i haven't been able to sort of find the right songs that put me in the mood because i've been quite frustrated mm-hmm. i've been quite anxious but then i've also been quite sleepy and just being like, okay, I need to stimulate my mind a bit more, but I can't find the track, I can't find the playlist. Let me put on um, a podcast to listen to. And then when I need to sort of de-stress, I put on my like, my Anita Bakers, or I've got like a, a listening to like the Megan Thee Stallion, or I'll put on Zane Lowe and Beats One. But no, I love, I love a thing. But I, I might, I think if it was off the top of my head, if something I had to go with, if I had to march into a protest, I would like to, I would think Sampa the Great Final Form because it's just, it, it takes like a 70s funk and soul sample, which I'm a big, you, big fan yeah, of. And she's Leon a, Bridges. But then Leon Bridges is incredible. Yeah. yeah. I think he's, he's oh yeah, oh, Leon Bridges and then Michael Kiwanuka as well. You like, oh, you, I love you like Leon Bridges, Michael Kiwanuka. I mean, like he did his last album, Kiwanuka, that came out, was it earlier on this year? Or oh, uh, late last year? Um, superb, actually superb. I think it was one of the, one of my favorite albums of the year, and it's just like I don't know him as a artist, as a storyteller. It's just you like um, piano joint was incredible, um, but that album from start to finish, it's, it feels very soulful. It feels like it could have been written in that very hot, hot summer. It's in, so authentic sounding, isn't it? Mm, and he's a sound guy. When I've seen him in interviews, and he used to host some shows on Six Music as well for a while, and he was just a fantastic. I just thought it was a fantastic DJ and curator of tracks and yeah, someone who speaks with such a very, very personal and dear relationship 
with not only creating music but listening to it and, comp- and com- uh, consuming it as well it's always good to know what your favorite artists are listening to and you can if when you go back and listen to you the remember work what you that, listened yeah. to what did he tell you? What, what what did he listen to what did he share with you well what when 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 what sorry um, what you mentioned how it's great finding out what your favorite artists are listening to and uh, mm. did michael share with you what he was listening to like, with me oh no that was in a that was a, on a show he was um on it when he was presenting some of the stuff on six music and what was he talking about he was talking about like growing up and not and he did it said it on them uh whose podcast was it uh Ramesh's podcast saying growing up and never seen people like him black people like himself in a alternative space mm-hmm. and i think until they mentioned people like block party and you know uh, there was dev haynes from test articles and obviously he worked with dead mouse as well so he was it was nice to see there was an artist who'd grown up at the same time as me listening to very similar stuff but being able to sort of channel those guys in in a completely different way do you know what i mean because he said he was listening to a lot of rock and roll and a lot of the indie music and a lot of um i don't know some people might call it the, the white music from the mid 2000s and like he was still able to... because rock and roll it started by black people so black music. I, I, it started, I can't remember her name she's a black woman oh i can't remember her name now i should know that she was like the first authentic rock and roll star but um yeah yeah we, we know where rock and roll came from <laughs> do you know what i mean um what is it was the Elvis Presley's manager said, "Find me a white boy who can sing like a Negro, and you've got yourself a film. You got yourself a star." And I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of, yeah, kind of understand that, I guess. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, I'm gonna just ask you one more question because I know you're quite busy. So no, it's alright. You get it's fine. It's cool. Uh, just, just this last question: What have you been doing to keep yourself sane through all of this? Um, I have been. Reading a lot of comics. I've been catching up with my. Oh, you're a comic book reader. I didn't know that. Yeah, I've got a lot. I'm like my walls and this cupboard down here. I don't know if you could. Yeah, I can see. see is that just full this, of comic books? It's just full of like. You can't really see it. It's just. Full oh of like my god. So, um, so usually, if I'm in a bad mood, I need to think. I'll. This is like quite a lot of years worth of comics i've still got some in my attic as well. I just sort of pull them out and reorganize, and I'll end up sort of. I could spend a couple of days on it and my room's just littered because I'll pull stuff out and I'll be reading it and I read this in ages and I'll just be reading you have stuff. Have a favorite so, one? Like a favorite kind um, of one? I think my favorite I think my favorite ever storyline was probably Why the Last Man mm-hmm. which is by by um Brian Kevon and um it's pretty much about a virus that kills all male mammals on earth and this oh, one guy called Yorick. Yeah. <laughs> and with this guy one guy called Yorick has to try and get from the estates to find his girlfriend in Australia. But by killing all males on the planet, you, oh, you know, there was, one. I think it was um, airplanes fell from the skies. If you think all governments fell apart, medical uh, industry, you know, medical facilities all came down in it's just industry, the whole planet fell, you fell apart because men take up most spaces. You know what I mean? And same thing with like music. And it was all about like rebuilding society. And you had a group of women called the Amazonians who believe this was, sent by um um the goddess of earth and you know they were quite hostile and when people found out he was a real guy some people wanted to kill him some people wanted to sleep with him some people wanted to capture him and he just wanted to get back to his girlfriend and anytime he used to talk to my friends about it, he'd be like oh mate that'd be mint if you're the if you're the if you're the, if you're the man alive you will just bang your way across the world wouldn't you and i'm like well that's not the point of the story do you? he wants to get to his girlfriend you know what i mean um but i've got a big i've got a soft spot for that's in terms of a complete indie comic. That's amazing. What did you X-Men say it's called again? Can you just repeat its name? Why the Last Man? Why the Last Man? Okay, I'm gonna look into. Yeah, that. I'm looking to that, and I've always been a big X Men fan because obviously um, X Men are the um, mutant minority metaphor. So basically, mm-hmm. to show American white Americans what it's like to be a black person in the states. You know, we've got Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Oh, AKA, I didn't even make, you've got make Magneto. The between Malcolm yeah. X and X-Men. How did I not make that connection? So, you, so you've got Malcolm X as Magneto. You've got Martin Luther King, who is um, Professor X, who are basically two civil rights leaders doing it by different means. Malcolm X, Magneto doing it by any means necessary. Professor X, Martin Luther King, by peaceful protesting and working alongside the oppressor. Um, so yeah, so I started reading X-Men when I was really, really young. And obviously with Spider-Man and... Um, 
I've read a lot of Spider-Man comics, especially the Miles Morales ones that was based on Donald did Glover. Because I remember the, the Donald. Yeah, so the Miles from the Spider Verse. So I remember the campaign for Donald Glover to become Spider Man in like I think it was two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Um, Would you have wanted him to be Spider Man? Yeah, because I remember like I've been a big Donald Glover fan since his early, early days on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, from um, when he did the um, what do you call it the Mystery Team film. Um, have you seen him in film. Community? Yeah, I used to like. I used to watch. Community. I stopped watching it when he left. Yeah. Um, but then it's like. Yeah, so I've, I've just been reading a lot of comics. I've been qu- getting, doing quite a bit of writing. I've just been trying to, in fact, I, I was away from this sort of stuff because I was on my phone all the time and it re- had a really bad knock-on effect. So I was on my phone all the time trying to like read up and keep in touch with the movement and see what's going, what are people are saying and then replying to comments and getting into debates, blah, blah, blah. So I was going to bed at like three in the morning and my body naturally wakes up around about seven, eight o'clock. So I was waking up tired not really wanting to exercise and then get on with stuff. So I was just, everything threw me out of sync for a good three weeks. I'm sort of getting back into it now. So well, I'm glad I'm yeah, happy it's li- to hear that. Yeah, it's getting better. I'm like, it's literally just reading and reading things that I enjoy. So I've just finished reading um, Children of Blood and Burn by um, Tommy Adeyemi. So that's a magic uh, fantasy, fantasy book. I'll show you how it. Um, yeah, this is it. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. So it's just like you very rarely see a lot of black people in fantasy and sci-fi. Um, but I'd, I'd call it an Afrofuturist book. Um, it, it's, it's wonderful. There's a lot of West African culture and heritage, especially stuff from Ghana and Nigeria, Mam, Ghanaian. Um, and it's just nice to see a really sort of empowering story, which looks at a lot of things that happen to black people in terms of oppression and not being able to sort of lean into and in, lean into who they are. Um, involved in this book so I try and sort of dance between fiction and non-fiction when I'm reading because I went through a period of reading like so much non-fiction so many books about race which just get me angry and get me frustrated yeah. and I think for a couple of years I stayed away break. from reading fiction pardon? You need to take breaks from all that heavy information yeah and like I've, I've read I've been reading so I alternate now between fiction and non-fiction and I'm going to read Akala's Natives again because I haven't read it for a while and um, I'm just it's just nice. So when I get into bed, I'm sat there reading. A, I'll read. A, I may, might read a comic or two, and then I'll spend an hour or something reading some books. And it's just nice being able to get into that space and read. Because the more I'm reading, the more I'm writing myself. Do you know what I mean? And it's definitely. just like, um, yeah, I've been reading more and writing more as well. It definitely is a different, co- definite correlation with how good your writing is and how many books you're supposed to like. You read to inspire. Mm. And, and it, yeah, it, and it, it doesn't make it a chore, does it? No. You know what I mean? I feel like sometimes you're like, oh God, but when you've read something where you're like, oh, I really like how that sentence was structured or I like to read, um, I don't know, I, I like, I like to write a lot of, um, we used to write a lot of short scripts and web series and the stuff I work on with friends. So even when I've read like prose or when I've read comics, it's a, there's a really good interest in sort of um, lesson to learn from story craft and descriptions and setting the scene and feeling and tone. But then when I'm reading comic books, it allows me to sort of not only get um, the development of characters, it allows me to follow a story, it allows me to sort of see patterns and setups and stuff, and obviously Would you dialogue. Would you comic? Oh, I've done some stuff in the past. So I, honestly, okay. my problem is I get too many ideas, and it's like, you know, on Saturday night when I got in, I, I should have gone to bed, but I did some cooking, did some baking, and then I sat down. And then um, I remember just sitting on the kitchen floor with some music playing, because there's this... Um, it started off as a comic idea and it's it went, and then it moved into a story I developed when I was doing my master's in creative writing and then it, it sort of becomes so much more over the past like 10 years it's grown and changed and I'm always adding bits to it and what's the main idea pieces. what's the main concept that you go um I get how would I sort of spill it I'm really weird about talking about it because I'm like I don't want people to steal my idea I guess the sort of the premise behind it is looking at it's looking at what it's like being an individual whose parents and people around you feel like they can mold you into what they think you should be. But it's all looking at about a a bunch of teenagers who are literally sort of designed in a way by their adults around them to become something where it's like, hang on a sec, where's my autonomy? Where's the, why are you trying to take my agency away from me? 
Yeah. It's like that is the sort of general sort of theme of the theme of the story, but it's set in a post Brexit Britain. That and sounds so good. Yeah, I'll talk. I don't want to talk to you after it's not been recording. Yeah, I, no, no, no. But it's, I don't know, I just like writing sort of, you know, I like writing stories of something that resonates. And with me, I know what it was like growing up, things around identity and belonging. Um, and I say tribalism in terms of like, okay, you know, finding something to cling to and to finding something to fight for. And how do you decide what these things are and what happens when you get it wrong? Yeah. Did it mean? Just yeah. I like I like stuff like that because I think like growing up here in especially in areas of the world like ours, especially as a black person, as any person of colour, it is the you you assimilate and then you rediscover yourself and you can simulate a bit more. And then it's so like how long is it until you how long does it take an individual before they feel like I don't have to shrink myself? I yeah. don't have to um I don't have to sort of make my blackness more comfortable for other yeah, people. What's the how long does it take point? That's an yeah. How long does it take? And it, you can tell stories like that in any way. Do you know I mean it doesn't have to be blackness? Does not mean it can be like you know, listening to a, oh, I'm really into this 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 genre of music, but my friends don't like this sort of thing, so maybe I can't really sort of express this one this thing that gives me life or that empowers me around these type around these people. But one day it'll break, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I know the stories everywhere. Like I get triggered by, I can be not think about anything, and then I can get triggered by a line in a song or a feeling from it, and be like, okay it'll take me to an idea or a bunch of characters or an individual that I have been working on and it helps me to sort of fit things around their story and it allows me to sort of imprint things into their emotional wound which is what you need for a character because they need to go through that that journey of growth you know what I mean they need to overcome that one thing that's holding them back and I I just like I think that's why I read a lot because there's so many different ways to do this to tell it and um, I think with comic books when I'm reading the comic book as I said you get all that everything you get from a book, storytelling, planning, character development. But you get the visuals as well. Do you know what I mean? And you think, okay, why have they used this panel? And why is the character looking like this? And why is this speech? And what is this all saying? And then what has happened in these bits in between when it's gone from one panel to the next? Why have we gone to show this? And there's just there's the craft of it. And it's consuming all these bits and just letting it rattle around in the dome a bit and regurgitating. Pardon? I think it's so cool how passionate you are about comic books. Like I never expected that. It's just like it's so kind of random, but it's like a lovely little piece of information about you, Kofi. Oh man, I love it. I think I think as you get to I think if you, as you get to know us, and I think if maybe quite a lot of my Instagram, I think quite a lot of people know because I've always just it's always just been a thing since I was younger. Like it started off, I think it started off with X Men and Spider Man and the cartoons, and then I got a lot into more into manga. An anime like with like like Dragon Ball Z and stuff like that, and um, but I know Battle Royales. I got really into sort of Japanese culture and like Samurai Jack yeah, anime. And party and stuff, just through anime. And then um, I got back into comics again when I started working. I got a job when I was like 14, 15, so I could start like affording things like you know the Titan Asian Extreme films or buying manga and buying comic books and stuff. And it just stuck with us because it went hand in hand with music. Mm-hmm. So I think even now, like my money doesn't get spent on a lot of stuff other than books comics and you know outside of covid i'd be i'd be traveling around the country to concerts two three times a month and i don't know it's just like it was just the way i, I like to live my life because that's i think that's where i get inspired i think that's what nourishes us being around individuals and strangers watching someone you know sing into a microphone or you know mm-hmm. going to like comic cons and stuff I, I i just love like i just love anything that can bring together people like strangers people who have got op- uh, opposite political views or sort of like op- opposite my uh, moral moral standpoints viewpoints yeah i just I've think there's so much actually, to be explored in that i've never actually gotten into anime so can you give me a title of one anime that i should watch before we next see each other oh man one anime to watch anime? before we next see each other uh i tell you what because i'm really i'm really sort of excited by this there's one called fire force now, if you've never watched an anime before, that could be a bit of a leap. But I just think in ter- it's season one's only like 21 episodes. Mm-hmm. The animation itself is fantastic. The soundscape, and this is the first anime that I've really watched in a while where sound itself could be a character because it's just so distinct in terms of, you know, how, how it's used in the storytelling and just how it's, how it's used in like fight scenes and stuff. It, it adds, 
yeah it, it's, oh you're proper gushing about this are you Brilliant. yeah yeah it's brilliant it's so good it's and it's got some really weird characters in it and the concept in it is just like basically it's about um you've got people in a world where they can control fire but you've got like a second generation who can manipulate it and third generations who can control it um who can who can sort of like um originate it and control it and it happens in different forms and right. got some people that are trying to figure out the truth as to how and why people can do this sort of stuff and other people that want to bury it it's quite political i just think quite a lot of like japanese animes have got a very sort of interesting political um underturn to the storytelling but they can look very sort of like quite fun and innocent but it gets yeah. like, like, like attack on titan is all about racism and class structures and um um Political parties keeping, um, I guess, you know, keeping the population in its place, mm-hmm. and keeping the population um, in a in a position where they're easy to control and to manipulate. And some people might be saying, "Oh, that's very close to how we're living our lives today." But um, you know, the detriment of that and how when you keep one person, one group of people, one group of people in a certain uh, in a certain position, but then you allow the advancements of others, what happens when these parties mix? You know what I mean? How do you deal with that? You know, it's just like, yeah, it's that you find a lot of stuff like that in um, like I said in, in Attack of Titan, but yeah, it's a, it's a big world. I just like, I just like the weird and wonderful and just mad concepts, and um, that yeah. you don't usually get from TV. But obviously, all this sort of stuff is crossing over into television now, which is which is interesting. Okay, yeah. brilliant. So, guess I'm watching Fire Force next time. Yeah. And we'll discuss it, but uh, I'm going to wrap it up. So thank you so much for your time and answering those questions. That's fine. Uh, I hope you have a great evening. So thank you again.